So I would first of all I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me to speak. It's been a great week with good talks, uh, so I've really enjoyed myself. And uh, it's great to be, take part and speak as well. All right, so I will be talking about this um, um, extreme open career type metrics and also stability of pairs. And really what uh, I want to advertise is, uh, is somehow that you shouldn't only be considering extreme open career type metrics uh, for uh, the metric version of a, ver of a conjecture by Donaldson. So the first thing I want to do is, is to get to the point where I explain what that conjecture is, uh, and then uh, I'll talk about the results and how they uh, relate to that conjecture. So this is a uh, joint with the Vestia Apostolov and uh, uh, Igor Vre. So uh, first of all, I'll, I'll briefly mention what I mean by Poincaré type metrics. So this is, uh, these are cusp metrics, but not cusp in, in the sense of, uh, that came up in Arezzo's talk. So uh, I'll start with briefly saying what, what, what those metrics are. So they are Kähler metrics. Um, defined on the complement of a divisor in a, in a compact uh, Kähler manifold. So X is a compact Kähler manifold. Uh, D is, is simple normal crossings, but I'll, I'll, I'll just mention smooth now. But uh, uh, in, in what we do, we actually deal with uh, simple normal crossings divisors. Uh, and they are of the form, they are asymptotic to the standard cusp metric plus a metric on D near D. So the standard cusp metric has uh, associated Taylor form given by I DC DC bar over set squared log squared. Uh, Set squared, so that's that's sort of the model, and the picture is uh, is uh, something like this. So this is a metric defined on the on the complement of uh, so the unit puncture disk in in C, and you should think of that the origin is at this way and in, at infinity. And It is. Okay, so um, so that's what I mean by Poincaré type, but I won't go into more about the asymptotics of it or anything. But uh, but this is Poincaré type or cusps for me. So all of this stuff is in well, Hirzebruch surfaces are toric toric manifolds, and the conjecture I mentioned at the start is um, has been phrased well at least in 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 toric uh, in the toric case. So a lot of what I'm going to do is, is in the toric world. So I'll, I'll, I'll recap a bit on toric geometry first.
Okay, so a toric manifold is a compactification of, uh, of the complex n torus. So we have an open dense subset in X. Uh, which is biholomorphic to the complex n torus, and we have an action of the complex n torus on X, so that under this identification, it extends the action of T and C to, its, uh, to itself. And the thing is that pairs of uh, toric manifolds, compact toric manifolds with the Kähler class they are uh, described by what's called del Sant polytopes. <coughs> so n-dimensional complex manifolds of del Sant polytopes in, in Rn. And the relation here is that you are allowed to change the polytope by translations and the action of SLNZ. Okay, so, so that means that, so this is a bounded convex polytope, so we can realize P as an intersection of upper half spaces. Okay, so the Li are uh, affine linear functions, and um, P is an intersection of such upper half spaces. So, and the Li here have a canonical scaling. from the del Sant condition. Okay, so in this talk, uh, there are only really two, two del Sant polytopes you will need to know. So one is just a triangle. And we have some parameter, um, say gamma, which has to be equal on both of the two sides of this. And this corresponds to P2. And the parameter gamma tells you how much, how big a multiple of the Fabini studiometric I have, or the class of the Fabini studiometric. So gamma times the class of the Fabini studiometric. Okay, the second set of examples are Hirzebruch surfaces. So they can be described in terms, so the manifold plus the Kähler class can be described by the following del Sant polytopes where we have a parameter uh, beta on this edge, we have a parameter alpha on the other, uh, saying the length and uh, then the length of this top part triangle is uh, alpha times uh, times k. So k corresponds to what Hirzebruch surface you have. And it's an integer which is bigger than or equal to zero. And alpha and beta are positive numbers, and they tell you the Kähler class. <laughs> so in these pictures, what you should think of is that if you look at a co-dimension one thing, so a facet, uh, an edge of, of the polytope, that corresponds to a divisor 
in the in the um, in the toric manifold, and uh, the length of that side tells you how big a volume that divisor has. So when you describe the, describe the volume of these two divisors in the Hirzebruck surface, in a Hirzebruck surface, then you tell what Kähler class you have. All right. So so there's a TN invariant version of the Yautian Donaldson conjecture uh, in this case. So I'm going to state that now, and the point is then to discuss what happens if, if, that, if you don't satisfy uh, um, that conjecture so that you, you don't have an extremal metric. That's, that's what we're going towards. So the Delsan condition gives you a um, normalized sc scaling for the, uh, the Li that defines the polytope. And this in turn gives you a normalized way of integrating over the boundary. So uh, there exists an associated boundary measure, really. Uh, n minus one form on uh, the boundary of a Delsan polytope. So now we can integrate over the boundary, and you can define a functional L of f as the difference between the integral over the boundary using this measure minus the integral over p of f times some function a times the uh, Lebesgue measure of Rn. And here, A uh, is uh, the unique affine function so that when you strict this, this Functional to the affine linear function, you get zero. That's n plus one conditions on n plus one variables, and you have a unique A. So the definition of stability, as uh, so a TN invariant definition of relative stability in, in the toric setting is the following. So let xp omega p be the Kähler manifold and Kähler class associated to a Delsant polytope p. Then we say that this is relatively k-stable in a TN invariant way if, uh, if this functional so I'll say what I mean by so for all convex piecewise linear functions uh, F So convex piecewise linear means that you are the maximum of a finite number of, uh, of affine linear functions. And this is a mouthful, so we usually just say that P is stable.
Okay. So YTD in this in this uh, context is that P is stable uh, if and only if there exists an extremal metric. So. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about stable pairs as well. Um, so I'm going to give the definition of that, that now. And then I'll start discussing this, uh, this conjecture of Donaldson. So we take a union of facets, which means that we are fixing a simple normal crossings divisor in X. And then the pair of P and F, which corresponds to the triple of the Kähler manifold, Kähler class, and the divisor, is stable If the same as, as the previous definition holds, but we replace L by integrating only over the portion of the boundary which is not in F. <coughs> And I'm putting an AF here because we're supposed to, we're not choosing, we're not supposed to choose that affine linear function associated to P. We need to choose the one associated to P and F so that this vanishes on, on affine linear functions. Okay. So natural question is, what happens if no extremal metric exists? Okay, on, on the whole of X. So Donaldson has a conjecture that you can then decompose the polytope P into subpolytopes. And those subpolytopes should be so that if you take one of them and take F in that definition to be uh, the new faces of that polytope, uh, then all of those should be uh, semi-stable. So I'll write that P is P1. So what do I mean by new, new facets? Um, 
I think it's best described in a picture, so I'll draw that on the next board. Okay, so let's assume that we had an unstable polytope. Then we should be able to divide it into sub-polytopes like this. So this is maybe my P1, this is my P2, this is my P3. And what I mean by the new facets are that they are, um, that they are these things. So And so if I look at P1, and I take, this is then my F1, this pair should be stable. And this should happen for all, all I. It should be semi-stable. Moreover, if they actually are stable, then they should uh, admit uh, symplectic potentials inducing complete extremal metrics on the complement of the divisors corresponding to the Fi. So in, in, the, in the usual compact case, you can describe metrics by a theory developed by Guillaume and Abreol, and you can do the same construction but changing your model potentials uh, and the hope is that you have such a symplectic potential, which is extremal, in this case when these are stable. So part of the motivation for the work that I'm talking about today is what are the asymptotics of those metrics? And one of the prime candidates have been Poincaré type metrics. Okay, so, so there are many examples of extremal Poincaré type metrics, and, uh, and uh, this has been one of the prime candidates. So I'll just give a couple of examples of, so the reason for me being interested in stable pairs like this is that they should come up in this situation. So now I'm just studying stable pairs on their own, trying to find out what happen if, happens when they are stable. So let's look at a couple of examples. So if we look at, again at, uh, at P2, and we take F to be, uh, to be one of the, of the facets, then, uh, so DF is a P1 inside P2, then the pair of, uh, of P and F is stable, and there exists an extremal Poincaré type metric. So this metric has been found both by, uh, by Abreu as a limit of uh, metrics with cone angle singularities, and, uh, and uh, Bryant. Okay, so in that situation, actually in all of the situations that I'm listing now, stability is going to be equivalent to the existence of an extremal Poincaré type metric. So if I instead choose two or three sides on a triangle, then it's uh, unstable. And no Poincaré type metric exists. OK. So the next case uh, is uh, 
It's the case of a square, a square corresponding to P1 cross P1. If we take P1 cross P1 in the toric world, this corresponds to a square. And if we choose F to be one or both of two adjacent sides, then, uh, then P uh, uh, and F is stable. And there exists an extremal Poincaré type metric. By using the product metric of things on P1. Um, yeah, on, on P1. And the final case is, so in all other cases of, of choosing F here, uh, it's unstable. It's unstable and no Poincaré type metrics exist. All right, so what, what we did was we went to the next examples you could think of, the higher uh, Hirzebruck surfaces. And the main point of what I'm going to say there is that this correspondence that you are stable if and only if you have an extremal Poincaré type metric does not hold in that situation. That is, uh, that is the main point uh, I want to, uh, to advertise. Which in particular means that if you're interested in this, uh, this conjecture by Donaldson, then you should allow for more types of, uh, of uh, asymptotics than just Poincaré type. OK, so the result is going to take um, a little bit of time uh, to, uh, to state. So maybe I will, so remember the Hirzebruck surface looked like, uh, looked like this. And I'm going to number the edges like, uh, like this. OK? So the theorem of uh, myself, Vesti and Ig, um, from, from last, from a couple of months ago, is the following. So let's take a uh, uh, Hirzebruck surface with a, with a polarization uh, corresponding to a polytope P. Uh, 
and we let f be a, uh, a union of one or more of the fi in the, in the picture. Then depending on what the fi are, not on the Kähler class, uh, we get a description of when, when these pairs are stable and also when uh, extremal point Poincaré type metrics exist. And there are three cases. So in the first case, when you take uh, one, either or both of the two parallel sides, then PF is stable and there exists an extremal Poincaré type metric. In the second case, where we instead take f equal to f2, f4, or two adjacent sides, then pf is stable But the point is uh, that no extremal point cadet type metric exists. But do you have existence? We have existence of, a, of an extremal metric. So we have a symplectic potential giving you an extremal metric, but it's not a point cadet type. How would you do that So I, uh, I'll finish stating this, and then I'll, I'll try to say something about that. Uh, and in all other cases, it's, uh, it's unstable. OK. So for example, if we look at case two, uh, that means that If you blow up P2 on the divisor where you have the Poincaré type singularity, um, then in no Kähler classes does it admit uh, an extremal Poincaré type metric, even though you had one uh, on before you blew up. So it means that if you want to do the Arezzo Picard theorem in this setting, you cannot just do it uh, maintaining the Poincaré type behavior uh, near the divisor. So you have to allow also the asymptotics of the metric to change. OK. So maybe I will say something about. Uh... OK, so the proof, the proof. Um... The proof uses really a construction due to uh, Evelyn Legendre and uh, also uh, uh, David Calderbank, Paul Galdershaw, and Vesti. Um, and, and we use their framework to get, to get these results. And uh, in one, we can really uh, identify, uh, we can say that uh, the, Poincaré, the metrics are a Poincaré type. In two, we use uh, a criterion on the, on the extremal vector field by, uh, by Ugg to conclude that they cannot be of uh, Poincaré type. And then we, uh, to actually, to get the stability results to make sure that they are stable, we use a, uh, a numerical criterion uh, from a previous situation um, that I looked at in my thesis uh, to, get, to get the stability results. Okay. 
So, um, so yeah, I can mention a bit about about uh, the metrics because I think that's um, that's interesting. So, as I briefly said, um, metrics on so T and invariant metrics on toric varieties are described by by convex functions. And in the smooth case, Functions modeled on a half x log x uh, give you uh, give you uh, uh, invariant me metrics. In the Poincaré type case. One replaces this x log x behavior with minus uh, a constant times log x plus another constant times x log x, where a is positive. And for what we at least really believe is true in case two is that you allow the coefficient here to be a little bit different. So you also need, uh, need that. So So potentials of the form um, minus a, uh, a plus c y log x uh, plus b x log x So if you, if you allow a non-zero coefficient where you are multiplying by, by y, so the, the other direction, then this, this will not give you uh, Poincaré type metrics. And it's these kind of potentials that we think you really need to allow for. Um, and with these metrics, they fail the Poincaré type direction sort of in the, in the um, mixed derivatives direction. So you are... The, yeah. So if you do the Legendre transform of this and follow through and <coughs> compute what these metrics give you, what these potentials give you, you get metrics which are not the Poincaré type, and it's really those metrics that we want to, we think you need to allow for. So I should say maybe that. Um, Earlier, Seklihidi also produced, in his thesis, produced examples of, of extremal Poincaré type metrics. And there he also encountered other types of asymptotic behaviors. But he ruled those out with a numerical criterion uh, based on the deformation to the normal cone. Um, when you go towards, so, so, um, that gives you a numerical criterion, and you can ask, is that satisfied for our examples? And it is. So these are genuinely a different behavior than what uh, Zekelihidi saw in his examples. So, okay. 
So I have uh, about five more minutes, is that it? Okay, very good. Any questions before I, before I move on? Yeah? Yeah, so, so actually in, in, our, in the paper, we say that if you have uh, an ex extremal Poincaré type metric, then you can determine A and B. That's, that's your question, right? Oh, I see, I see, I see. Yeah. So a priori, you could have to allow for any A and B, so any A positive and B real, but we really determine it if, an, if it is a Poincaré type. Presumably, you could do the same thing here with these things, but... Uh, the proof was already, we didn't try that. Let's see, let me just say that. Okay. Okay. So So the proof uses this um, uh, ambitoric uh, construction by, uh, by a postulate of Calderbank and Gaudenshaw and also the orthotoric uh, construction by, by Evelyn Legendre. Um, so, So when k is bigger than or equal to 1, the Hilsebrook surfaces are not rectangles. But in the ambitoric construction, you give a new parameterization or coordinates for your, uh, uh, for your quadrilateral, which realizes that quadrilateral as, as uh, the image of a rectangle. And then you use product metrics in, in the rectangle coordinates uh, to get some non-product ones in, in, the, in, in the original symplectic coordinates. And if you choose the correct parameterization of Q using those coordinates, you can get extremal metrics. And the fact is that if you are looking for extremal metrics, then you can choose a preferred set of ambitoric coordinates where you can realize that uh, extremal metric.
So So the metrics are described by two functions, a and b, and and the thing is that you can reduce this theorem to a to a simpler case where you can get a really simple criterion for for stability. So uh, the a and b have to be quartic. So these have to be quartic polynomials. Um, and what I want to convince you of is that if you're looking at the case where you're having um, f being two adjacent edges, then you should be able to get a simple criterion for stability. And that's what we use in order to get stability in all cases. So these a and b are, are two, two functions, two quartics. And if they need to be positive, um, they need to be positive on their domain of definition, uh, except the endpoints. And if you want a a, a Poincaré type metric, you need. You need to have a double zero at the edge corresponding to the Poincaré type metric. So you see, if, if, if you have a double zero at A1, a simple zero at A0, and you go up in this direction, then there is no way that you can go zero, be, become zero in this uh, domain. So the point is that everything is governed by what happens near A1. And using that, we can get a simple criterion for stability, which actually allows us to prove uh, that uh, the stability part of, uh, of the theorem. And it also, using their construction, we, we, can, we can really look at what the metrics are. Um, OK. Um, I think I'll stop here, yeah. <laughs>